Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to User Education. Um, today I would like to solve a few problems related to kinetic energy. Um, now, this lecture is part of the whole course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. Um, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the Unizor.com. Um, it's a free website which contains the whole course in logical sequence of lectures, plus every lecture is supplemented with um, textual description, basically like a textbook, and there are exams for those who would like to challenge themselves. Um, also, the same website contains prerequisite course for this one, which is called Mass for Teens, because as you know, physics cannot actually survive without mass. So, um, well, especially calculus and vector algebra, that's what you probably will need the most from the mass course. So, back to energy, kinetic energy, and the few problems which I have. Um, okay, now, let's start with a very simple one. So, you have a car of mass m, which accelerates during the time t from speed 0 to speed, uh, some kind of a maximum speed and uh, acceleration is given. So, mass is given, time is given, and acceleration is given. So, my question is, what's the work performed by the engine of this car? And uh, what's the kinetic energy at the very end of this acceleration? All right, so let's just do it one thing at a time. First of all, speaking about work. Now, work is equal to force times distance. Well, in case we're talking about uh, 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 straight motion along the straight line with a constant um, force. Now, force is constant because the mass is assumed constant. Uh, we ignore actually some losses of mass for uh, the gas which we are burning, right? So, generally speaking, the mass is the same and uh, acceleration we have already uh, said it's constant. So, the force is uh, constant. So, if the constant force act acts on the distance s, you've got the uh, this formula for the work, right? That's the definition, basically. Now, do we know F? Yes, it's M times A. This is the second law of Newton. Now, speaking about the distance, well, distance, if you are traveling from speed zero to certain maximum speed with a constant acceleration a, then it's equal to a t squared over 2. This is simple kinematics, and if you forgot about this, just go to kinematics part of this course where everything is explained. So, we know this, right? Okay, so let's calculate what is uh, the work. Work is equal to uh, m a squared t squared divided by 2. Correct? Multiply this by this. Now, speaking about kinetic energy at the very end. Well, kinetic energy at the very end is equal to m v max squared over 2. Again, that's basically was derived in the previous lecture, which defined what is uh, kinetic energy. Now, what is the Vmax? What is the maximum speed if you have accelerated with a constant acceleration A during the time T? Well, obviously, Vmax is equal to A times T, which again is basic kinematics. So, m squared a squared t squared divided by 2. So we have exactly the same expression. As expected, energy is very much related to work. So the work which we are spending accelerating the car is basically transformed into the kinetic energy at the very end of this process. So that's the answer for the work and for kinetic energy. 
Next problem. Okay, now we are, instead of accelerating, we are decelerating the car. So let's assume that the car moves uh, with a speed V. And then uh, the driver sees some kind of an obstacle in front of him. So he basically breaks down. So the speed goes down. And he stops completely after... Uh, distance s. Now, we are assuming again that the mass of the car is constant, although I do not specify it in this particular case. What I do need is, I need the coefficient of friction. Now, why am I talking about coefficient of friction? Well, think about it. If you press the brakes, then the, the, the wheels of the car basically stop rotating. And the car moves forward by inertia. And what is actually uh, slows the car down? Well, the force of friction of the wheels against the ground. So friction is very much involved here. That's the only force, actually, which acts on the car, which basically slows down from the V uh, to zero. And that's why the coefficient of friction is very important. So what I'm right now asking is, what is this coefficient of friction if all we know is initial speed and the distance during which we have slowed down to zero? Well, first of all, let's just think about it. Friction is the only force. Now, is it a constant force? Well, we know that the friction is equal to weight, which is m times g, where g is acceleration of the free fall, and m is the mass, times coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, we are assuming that this is the constant, although unknown. Well, g is, again, acceleration of the free fall, which is constant. On Earth, it's 9.8 meters per second square. Mu is, again, that's a coefficient of friction. That's a constant. So F is, fun, uh, is constant. F is constant. M is constant. That means that our acceleration, well, deceleration in this case, negative acceleration, is constant as well, right? So negative acceleration is equal to um, force divided by mass, which is g times mu. So if we know this acceleration, we can definitely find out what's the coefficient of the kinetic friction. All right? So all we need to do is find out acceleration if we know the distance and initial speed. OK, this is simple algebra related to kinetics. So first of all, we know that s is equal to a t squared over 2, where t is the time which we spent slowing down from v to 0. On the other hand, since a is a constant, uh, v is equal to a t, right? Well, again, A in theory is negative because F is negative. <coughs> so, obviously, if I'm talking about absolute values, let's just talk about absolute values only. Everything is positive. So these are two uh, equations with two variables from which we can find A and T. The time which we have spent to slowing down and the acceleration, well, deceleration, if you wish. All right? So, that's easy. Um, first of all, we can determine time from here, which is V over A. Substitute it into this, we get S is equal to A times T squared, which is V squared divided by A squared, and 2. All right, so this is out. So V squared divided by 2A, from which A is equal to 
v squared divided by 2s. Fine. We found a, and that's why nu is equal to a divided by g, which is v squared divided by 2gs. That's the answer. That's our coefficient of friction. Now, notice very important thing, by the way, that it does not depend on the mass. I told you the mass is constant, but I did not specify the mass. Mass is unknown, and doesn't really matter what the mass is. If you have initial speed, and you have the distance which you spent slowing down from that initial speed to zero, that's sufficient to find out the coefficient of friction. Obviously, if you have a more massive car, it will take basically a longer distance to slow it down, right? So that's why. All right, next. Next is the following. You have on a thread, this is a vertical, on a thread you have some kind of an object, point object, obviously, uh, of uh, mass m, and the thread is of the length l. And it performs circular movements. So you're holding the, the thread at the top, and it just rotates um, around the vertical. Now, what is known is uh, length of the thread, mass, and this angle. No other forces right now are actually uh, no other forces are actually acting on um, this particular object. All right. So, what we have to do is we have to find out what is the kinetic energy of this particular object. Well, kinetic energy of this particular object is mv squared over 2, where E is, where V is its linear speed. So, basically what we have to do is we have to find the linear speed uh, using whatever parameters I have. Now, you probably have noticed, if you did yourself this type of an experiment, the faster it rotates, the uh, more horizontal the line on which um, this object is hanging becomes. So it's almost like whenever you're doing it very, very fast, it will, all, it will be almost 90 degree. But if it's a slow, then it will be much closer to the vertical, right? So, the angle is very important. And again, the angle is very much dependent uh, on the speed. The faster the speed, the bigger the angle, closer it is to 90 degree. All right, so how can we approach this particular thing? All right, first of all, um, we know that the linear speed is actually equal to radius times angular speed, right? We know it from, again, from kinematics of rotational um, motions. All right. We also know that whenever we have a rotation of the object, there is always the centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. What is centripetal force? Well, that's the force actually which um, forces this object, instead of going straight, it goes uh, back, back to the center to maintain the same position of the center. So it's a tension of this thread. In this case, it's not the tension of this thread, it's a component, horizontal component. So there is always a centripetal force and centripetal acceleration, which is equal to r omega square. Again, this is the formula from uh, kinematics of uh, rotational movement. You can go to a corresponding lecture in this course where I explain why it is. But, or, this is the same thing, it's v square, which is r square omega square, 
divided by r, right? Now, what we also know is the acceleration is equal to force of centripetal force divided by mass, because this is just a Newton's law. And all we have to do right now, therefore, is to find uh, the centripetal force. From the force, we will find acceleration. From acceleration, we find v square, and v square is participating in uh, expression for ex uh, energy. Okay. Well, r, also r. r is simple. r is this one. So r is equal to L sine phi. That's simple. Now, the F is slightly more difficult. Here is how we will do it. Now, this is the force of uh, the gravity, which is m times g, right? Where g is acceleration of the free fall, m is a mass. Now, this is the tension of the thread. And this tension should actually be um, uh, represented as the sum of two forces. One of them is vertical acting against the uh, uh, the gravity and another is centripetal so it's this way and this is a centripetal force. So this force which is the tension is supposed to be represented as the sum of two forces, two vectors. This one, which is equal uh, in magnitude but opposite in direction to the gravity, and this one, which actually keeps it on the orbit, keeps it on the circular trajectory. This is the force which is actually the uh, centripetal force here. How can we determine it? Well, very simply. Now, this is parallelogram. So this is also phi. Now this is mg. So this force F is equal to mg uh, times tangent phi. All right, fine. So we've got that. And that's actually all we need right now. Everything else is just trivial manipulation with the formulas. So what we do is, from this, we determine v square, which is equal to f times r divided by m, which is equal to f m g tangent phi times r. r is l sine phi and divided by m. So that's my v square. And since I found v square, I can find kinetic energy, which is equal to m v square, which is uh, g tangent phi l sine phi divided by 2. That's the answer. That's my kinetic energy. And again, obviously, it depends on the phi, on the angle. The, um, uh, the higher, the, the greater the, the angle, both sine and, uh, uh, and, and, tan and tangent are uh, increasing as the angle increasing. If phi is equal to zero, it's uh, zero. So basically, it means that the object is hanging vertically, it doesn't really perform any movements because the angle is zero, right? And the greater the angle, the more um, we have here. Now, um, what's important in this particular case is um, to understand that, you see, if my um, if my angle goes to closer to 90 degrees, 
you see tangent of uh, 90 degrees uh, tangent is sine over cosine right the sine is equal to 1 but the cosine is equal to 0 uh, so basically my energy is going to infinity in this particular case because the cosine will be in the in the denominator because the speed must actually go to infinity which means that we can not we can never achieve 90 degree exactly we can achieve like 89 or 89.9 or whatever but not 90 degree exactly and obviously it all depends on the strength of the thread because the the, the, the faster you uh, are rotating the stronger the force on my on my picture this force of uh, uh, w w which goes along the thread it's supposed to be greater and greater the tension has its own limits obviously so that's also a restriction the, the faster you're moving the stronger should be your your thread all right so that's it for this particular problem and we have one more three down one to go Okay. Now this is about pendulum. So you have a pendulum. So it goes this and this. Not circular movement, but movements back and forth, back and forth within the plane. All right. So we have a pendulum, and we also have the length and the mass. All right, now, here is uh, a side note. Now, if you go to this particular course, to um, the chapter, to a lecture, which is about pendulum, um, and I do suggest you actually to review maybe this lecture again, the problem is that the, the real exact equation for pendulum movement and the movement is actually a function of the angle of time. Well, it cannot it can it cannot be expressed in in normal formulas which we know because it goes to some kind of a differential equation, which does not really um, uh, solvable in in regular algebraic formulas. However, if these um, oscillations of the pendulum are small, very close to the vertical, then approximation of this formula is the following. So square root of g, which is acceleration of uh, the free fall, divided by length of the uh, thread um, divided uh, multiplied by t that's the uh, under th that's what goes under cosine phi zero is initial angle from which we start the motion so first we initially put it at the angle phi zero and let it go and then under the force of gravity it goes um, into oscillation and this is the function of time this function is derived in again in the lecture dedicated to uh, uh, to, to the pendulum and again I, I would like to make sure that you understand this is an approximation only for uh, oscillations which are very close to vertical very small oscillation of the of the pendulum so maybe it's a very long um, uh, thread and then it goes to a very small distance from the um, from the neutral state well um, well that that's unfortunate I mean uh, we would like actually to express it in the formula which is like always true uh, not an approximation but we will just deal with so-called small oscillations which can be expressed in this particular formula, albeit approximately. Okay, now, 
what's necessary to do is to find out the kinetic energy at the lowest point so whenever the uh, the pendulum goes through this point that's obviously the point where its linear speed is maximum right this is linear speed zero then we let it go it goes accelerates because the force of gravity pushing it this way and that's why there is an acceleration component here gravity this way tension that k and uh, uh, the uh, result of these two forces goes along the trajectory and it speeds up to this point now starting from this point it slows down because the force will be this way against the movement so from this point the beginning force goes along the movement after this um, tension and gravity uh, are uh, exactly opposite and equal in, in magnitude so there is no additional push but starting from movement to this direction uh, to this half of this uh, uh, oscillation then the force would be against the movement and that's why it will be slowed down until the top position and on this end and then goes back again accelerating decelerating so we are interested in kinetic energy at the very bottom where the speed is the maximum considering this is the formula approximate as it is but it's a formula now if you go to this lecture uh, about the uh, oscillation of uh, pendulum you would also find the formula for a period well this is actually simple because the period of cosine is 2 pi and if you have a period of the function k times x it's 2 pi divided by x right so that's why 2 pi this is square root of g over l this is l over g so this is obviously the period it comes from the um, properties of the cosine so we know the period since we know the period we basically know the time from the beginning until it reaches this maximum position now what is what is the period of cosine we go this way and then this way so if we are interested only in this piece that's basically t divided by 4 which is pi over 2 square root of l divided by g now using this we can obviously find the angular uh, speed now what is angular speed if we have a dependency of the angle of time angular speed is a derivative of this right now derivative omega of t is equal to first derivative of time uh, of uh, angle by time which is uh, so derivative of uh, constant goes out obviously of cosine is a minus sign and then I have to multiply by derivative of the inner function so it would be minus uh, phi 0 square root of g over l sine of square root of g over l t so that's my function of angular speed since i have angular speed i can find out linear speed linear speed of t is equal to r times radius well radius is l so i can just put straight l times angular speed right so linear speed is always radius times angular speed so we've got that which is equal to minus phi zero I multiply by L this is square root of L in the denominator so it will be square root of G L times sine of square root of g over l t and at this moment of time whenever we are crossing this point we have to substitute instead of the time t 
lowercase t, we have to substitute the value t over 4, which is this one, and that's why b maximum would be equal to um, minus phi 0 square root of gl times sine of square root of gl times pi over 2 times square root of l over g. So this cancels this. Sine of p over 2 is 1. So what we have is only this. So, what's my energy? Kinetic energy is equal to m v max square, which is phi square, phi zero square, times g times l divided by two. That's it. That's my energy at the very, very uh, bottom of this oscillation. Well, that's it for today. <coughs> I do suggest you to um, maybe read the same lecture on the website. I mean, read textual description of this lecture where I present the problems and uh, in some cases full solution, in some cases a very brief solution uh, and an answer, but I do recommend you to try to solve all these problems just by yourself and check the answer against whatever is provided in the lecture. Well, that's it. Thanks very much and good luck.